Hello and welcome to this ITER talk. My name is Ian Bonnet and today we're going to be covering the tritium plant at ITER. The video is split into three parts. First we're going to go uh, over the basic properties uh, of tritium and then we're going to look at how we use tritium at ITER and some of the challenges and then finally we're going to look at how we overcome some of these challenges and the solutions and the systems and technology that we've selected and we're building here at ETER. Okay, let's get going with the basics. And where better to start than the building blocks of the universe? Elements. These are the constituent parts of matter, and uh, we distinguish them by the makeup of their atoms, namely by the number of protons in their nucleus. And if we look at, at an atom, and here's one uh, hydrogen, number one, uh, we can see that there's a proton in the nucleus and it's orbited by a, an electron, a negative particle. Now, the, the elements we've discovered so far are arranged in the periodic table, starting with hydrogen here, number one, all the way up to 118 organism. But when we look at the particles, we find that there's another particle, a neutral uh, particle called a neutron, and this can exist in the nucleus as well. And here's an example. And so we've got the same number of protons, number one, but we've uh, got a, a neutron now in the nucleus. And so the atom is twice as heavy. And so this slightly changes the properties. And so these different versions of the same element are called isotopes. And we'll take now a look at the isotopes of hydrogen. Here are the three isotopes of hydrogen. And they're special because they're named. And there's a story behind the naming. Uh, the second isotope uh, was discovered by Harold Urey in 31, uh, and then a couple of years later, Ernest Rutherford and his buddies at Cambridge University discovered tritium. And then there was a big debate about what to call these isotopes. Rutherford wanted to call uh, the second and third isotope uh, diplogen and triplogen, but luckily Harold won through and we ended up with deuterium and tritium, which is quite good because I don't want to be known as the triplogen plant uh, section leader. So let's have a look at these isotopes. So the first one we call uh, is protium. This is one with one neutron in the, sorry, one proton in the nucleus uh, and is the most abundant. This is what we normally think about when we talk about hydrogen. The second hydro, uh, hydrogen isotope is deuterium. The proton is joined by a neutron. It's roughly twice the weight of, uh, of uh, protium uh, and its natural abundance is around 150 parts per million uh, naturally, and it varies depending on where you are, uh, for example, uh, in seawater or inland lakes in Africa. And then finally, uh, the heavy isotope, super heavy isotope of hydrogen, uh, tritium, which has got two neutrons in the nucleus. It has a very, very low natural abundance, uh, 10 to the minus 18, that's one millionth million, million, and it's created in the upper atmospheres through the interaction of cosmic rays and nitrogen. On to a little bit more about tritium. Tritium is uh, unstable, it's radioactive, and it decays to natural, to uh, stable helium-3 by an emission of an electron, a beta particle, and an anti-neutrino. So now the beta particle is very, very low energy. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 5.7 kilo electron volts, and, uh, and a kilo electron volts is a measure of, of energy. Uh, particularly used in particle physics and particle science, and it relates to the energy of stopping an electron in a vacuum. And just for reference to those that are for a more familiar uh, unit, a joule, uh, one kilo electron volt is one to the minus 16. And so it's an extremely low amount of energy. And for those of us that are old enough to uh, remember cathode ray tube products such as monitors, the Bremsstrahler or the braking radiation uh, measured from, emitted from these uh, devices is, is, has been measured between 17 and 30 kilo electron volts. And so a, a very, very uh, low amount of energy. The decay uh, has a half-life of around 12 years. So that's the, the time it takes for half of the tritium to decay to helium-3. And so roughly that's around 5% a year. So let's take a look at hydrogen and chemistry. So hydrogen is ubiquitous. It's the most common element in our universe. It has the most compounds or reactions with any other element we have found. 
and uh, we've got similar chemistry for all of the isotopes. So hydrogen likes to go around in pairs, and that's the same for uh, deuterium and tritium, and so with the elemental molecular form H2, D2, and T2. Uh, hydrogen luckily reacts with, with oxygen and uh, forms water, and so does deuterium and tritium. And this is, uh, you may have heard of heavy water, or well, that's deuterium oxide, and uh, super heavy water, that's tritium oxide. And uh, hydrogen will also react with organic compounds. And here is uh, a reaction to form methane, and so does uh, deuterium and tritium uh, with deteriorated uh, uh, methane and tritiated methane. Now, uh, we've got these uh, uh, molecules with the various isotopes, but what can actually happen is they can get mixed up and you can form uh, various mixtures. And so we can have uh, one, uh, high, uh, one protium and one deuterium to form HD, likewise with protium and tritium, HT, and finally DT, uh, deuterium and tritium. And the same happens with water as well. Um, and uh, depending on the molecule, uh, it also happens with uh, organics. Um, and these mixtures are called isotopologues. And instead of writing out all six, uh, we refer and um, borrow the, the, the letter Q, and so what you see is Q2 to mean these six isotopologues of hydrogen uh, elemental form, and also Q2O for uh, uh, water. We're now going to take a, a look at some of the properties of hydrogen, uh, and, uh, and how uh, this will then influence how we handle the, the tritium and, and deuterium in ITER. And the first one we're going to talk about is permeation. And hydrogen Q2 can readily uh, permeate through metals. It's a five-stage process with physical absorption, disassociation, uh, atomic diffusion, and then uh, recombination, and then desorption on the low side. And uh, this happens, this is temperature driven, and uh, this is a nice plot I've taken from one of my friends, uh, Florian, from her PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, what you can see here is at higher temperatures, uh, the permeation uh, significantly increases. Um, and also when we have higher pressures, uh, hydrogen can affect uh, the properties of metals and can reduce uh, the strength and yield and eventually could actually lead to fracture. Um, and this is a problem when we're dealing with high pressures and temperatures, but within the tritium plant, we can actually make use of this and so we'll talk about this later in the video. Next thing is radiochemistry. And now, even though the beta particle is very weak, it has the ability to catalyze reactions that one would not normally expect protium to undergo. And so it can actually react with itself. And so at very high concentrations, certainly in the water form, um, we can see a various mixtures of compounds formed. And uh, for example, here, we see tritiated uh, peroxide, and this is highly corrosive. It also reacts with other gases that you would not normally expect unless you had a very high temperatures or a catalyst present. And so here is the formation of tritiated uh, ammonia. And then finally, it can promote polymerization in organic compounds, and this would only normally be uh, performed with protium if you added a polymerization agent or catalyst. And so this is something to be aware of when we're dealing with higher concentrations of tritiated products. The next topic is about hydride. And there are certain metals, typically in the group five, where the hydrogen can form uh, a hydride. And here's an example here. And uh, the property is very useful because the, me uh, the metal uh, forms a hydride, sucks on uh, the, the, the hydrogen, and can uh, reduce the pressure above it to a very low pressure. And the good thing is this is a fully reversible process. And so if we want to get the hydrogen back out of the metal, all we have to do is simply heat this up. Uh, and this is a very useful property for us, as you'll find out later in our storage and delivery system. OK, and then just to wrap up this section, we'll just look at some of the commercial and other R&D uses. Uh, so first of all, tritium is used in luminescent devices, such as uh, air, uh, airport strip lighting, uh, uh, ex uh, exit signs, and also watches uh, using uh, the uh, weak beta is used to excite the, uh, the luminescence from the phosphor. 
Also, uh, tritium is used in the pharmaceutical and drug discovery industry. This is where I started my career with tritium. Uh, it's a very good way of uh, labeling a compound, and then you can actually use the beta decay to find out how that compound interacts with various other chemicals. We obviously use it in experiments, and so we're going to be talking about it here at ITA, but it was also used in uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, in California, and uh, they had the breakthrough late last year in December where we had net gain energy from a fusion experiment, which was a big breakthrough. We are also, or well, they're also using tritium in the neutrino experiment in Karlsruhe, where they're trying to determine the mass of a neutrino. And then finally, I have found some dubious patents filed for products that haven't seen markets, such as a luminous golf ball or uh, a fishing float. Okay, so now we know a little bit more, more about tritium. Let's look about how we use tritium at ITA. So hopefully uh, you guys have looked at the channel. Uh, there's many videos. Uh, here is uh, Alberto, the division head for science, explaining uh, the fusion science behind ITER and the selection of DT uh, being the uh, most probable way of, of getting a successful burner at the lowest temperature. And just to remind everybody, this is the reaction where an ion of uh, deuterium and tritium fuse to create a helium-4 atom and an emission of a high energy neutron. We have selected here at ITER magnetic confinement and uh, with the DT and the magnetic confinement uh, reactor, this then dictates some of the technology and choices that we need to make in what we call the fuel cycle. And the first one is how we get the fuel into the reactor. Now, the magnetic fusion plasma resists the injection of new fresh fuel into the plasma. And so what we need to do is uh, freeze pellets of deuterium and tritium and fire them at very high speeds into the center of the plasma. And uh, there will be a video by my buddy, So Mariama, the fueling and wall conditioning section leader, that will explain about how we do this in the fueling machines. As the fusion reactor proceeds, we burn and create helium. We call this helium ash. And this builds up in the core of the, of the plasma. And if we don't remove that, it will dilute and prevent further fusion reactions. And so we have to remove the helium. As we remove the helium, we also remove uh, deuterium and tritium, and tritium is expensive and radioactive. And when you look at the uh, physics, we only burn around 1% of the fuel. And so we need to be able to uh, recycle uh, the material. If you imagine you had a car and you only burnt 1% of your fuel, you would want to recycle that, and that's what we do. And that then drives the design and the need of the tritium plant to be able to extract and reprocess uh, the fuel so that it could be re-injected into the reactor. And finally, uh, we have vacuum pumping systems to create the plasma. We need vacuum conditions and then to remove the gas. And Robert Pierce has got a very long video on the vacuum pumping system online. So we've now determined that we need to have a fuel cycle. But when we look at uh, ITER, uh, we just don't have just one. We actually have three. And the first one is the one that everybody talks about, which is the injection of fuel into the reactor uh, and cycling back through the tritium plant for re-injection. But at ITER, we have uh, neutral beams, both for heating and diagnostics. And these use deuterium and proteum uh, with trace levels of tritium. And so we need to reprocess the gas that's collected on the cryo panels of the neutral beams. And then finally, we have um, a uh, water loop where we recover tritium uh, from uh, uh, water systems to recycle tritium back into the system. And so here we can see that we've got three interconnected loops in the fuel cycle. And this is the part of the fuel cycle which uh, belongs to the tritium plant, and this is what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of the talk. Now we're going to go through some of the challenges of it. And the first one is one of time or processing time. Uh, and here is a simple graphic to show uh, how a shot or would work. Uh, we typically provide uh, a shot, a, a batch of deuterium and tritium. Uh, and here, we, in this example, it's a 450 second shot. But with this uh, material, we also need to provide a seeding gas, either argon or neon. And these are used to help control the plasma and keep the plasma away from the edges of the reactor. And in this example, we'll have, say, around a, a 0.3 burn 
And so we uh, have around 99.7% 90, uh, of the fuel being removed with the helium ash and, and the seeding gases. And because of uh, the processing demands, the length of the shots, and also the limits we have on inventory, we have around half an hour to an hour to reprocess this material, uh, which, remove, which includes removing the helium and the argon and, and any other uh, impurities, and then separating the tritium and tritium back into their isotopes for reinjection. And this is a very challenging activity given the complications of dealing with uh, isotopes and hydrogen and the impurities. The next one is about how the gas arrives uh, at, uh, at the tritium plant. And uh, at around about the 40 minute mark, Robert finally gets around to describe a cryo pump. And uh, in simplistic terms, these are, these, these are a very simple device, uh, a, a vessel with a, a cold wall with a special surface held at very cold temperatures, cryogenic temperatures, which sucks gas onto them. And uh, the gas builds up, as you can see in this simple graphic, and at a certain point, they have to be regenerated and where the, the, the inlet valve is closed and, and the, the uh, cryo panels are warmed up and the gas is then uh, evolved from and then sent to the treating plant. And the problem with this is at some points in time, there's no flow to the treating plant and then we have a huge spike of, of flow to manage. And there's an analogy here. At the moment uh, in March, uh, it's the Six Nations and uh, at Cardiff, uh, this is a typical picture uh, on a match day where everybody turns up at the train station at the same time. Though to get everybody on the train at the same time, uh, one would need a very, very large train, and this is a good example, uh, one that travels between Adelaide and Darwin, both places I've been, uh, and this is a huge train. And, uh, but typically what happens is at most stations is people uh, average out when uh, people turn up and so you need a smaller train. And in chemical plants, this is normally managed by the use of buffer tanks, such as you know, oil refineries, such as uh, product storage and feed storage. Um, though at ITER, because of uh, the limitations we have in terms of the quantity of tritium and the expense, we don't have the luxury of using buffer storage tanks. And so we have to use complicated uh, and interconnected control systems. The third challenge uh, is one of multiple spinning plates at the same time. And uh, we've already introduced that we've got three uh, interconnecting loops, uh, but we've also got multiple customers and those customers need gas, different gas at different times at different compositions. Uh, and while they want these uh, different products, we're receiving gas, which is uh, not steady as we've learned before, but also of different compositions. And so this is a, a very challenging aspect in terms of designing a plant and leads to parallel processing trains in order to produce and handle these demands. And the last challenge is one of scale. The current state of art uh, for fusion reactors uh, were kind of modest in terms of their fusion power and their burn length. And the uh, throughput of the fuel cycle was around uh, 0.1 kilogram of an hour. Here at ITER, we are taking things up uh, an order of magnitude uh, with the size of the uh, machine, and we're around about a kilogram an hour. And so this is now taking technology an order of magnitude up, uh, and this itself is proving to be challenging. But the good news is, is that when you look at the demo reactor in terms of their online time and their increased burn rate, their fuel cycle demand is similar. And so the problems we're solving today at ITER will also solve that of the next stage demo reactors. Okay. So we looked at some of the challenges, now look at, let's look at how we've solved them. Right, so unimaginatively, the tritium plant is located within the tritium building here at ITER. It's a fairly large building, seven storeys, and we occupy the majority of the space. And in the graphic, you can see the various systems and where they're located. The tritium building is part of the nuclear complex. It shares the same base mat as the diagnostic building and the to uh, tokamak building and uh, you can see it here on the left in the graphic. We have subsystems, and there's six of them in the tritium plant. I'm going to take a, a quick uh, run through each of them and how they're connected together. So first we have the tokamak exhaust processing system. This receives the exhaust from the reactor via the vacuum pumping systems, and it has two primary functions or goals. One, first of all, to separate impurities from the hydrogen isotopes, 
And the second is to recover hydrogen from impurity gases such as methane and ammonia. So it produces two product streams, one a purified hydrogen isotope stream and the other the impurity stream. We follow the hydrogen stream, it goes to the isotope separation system. And again, no surprise, here we separate the isotopes of hydrogen, uh, the tritium and the tritium, and then a, sm a small stream of uh, protium with uh, uh, traces of tritium. Uh, the product streams, deuterium and uh, tritium, are sent to the storage and delivery system. This system stores and buffers uh, ready for fueling. It also allows us to introduce new tritium from overseas when we need to uh, fuel the system up with tritium. Back to the impurity system from TEP. This is sent to an abatement system, the atmospheric detritiation system. This is a system that aims to recover as much tritium from impurities as possible. It also serves to clean up the vacuum vessel before maintenance and also recovers tritium from other uh, locations such as glove boxes. Um, the, uh, the tritium is recovered uh, as water and is sent to the water detritiation system. And, and this is a system that is uh, designed to uh, strip proteum from tritium. The tritium is recovered and sent to the isotope separation system and the proteum is removed from the plant. And to support all of these five subsystems, we have an analytical system that pro provides both chemical and isotopic analysis to ensure that the system works as we expect and to provide inventory management as well. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit more at uh, the subsystems. The first one is the tokamak resource processing system. This is being uh, designed and delivered by our friends from Savannah River National Laboratory on behalf of the USDA. As a reminder, we have uh, the exhaust, the soup of different chemicals coming from the vacuum vessel and the vacuum pumping system. But we also take the products from the test blanket module system, and Luciano's got a video all about that. We then separate uh, the, these uh, compounds and these gases into a purified hydrogen stream and impurity stream. There's lots of different technology used in the tokamak exhaust processing, but we'll take a look at one particular piece of neat technology the palladium membrane reactor. Not because my boss, Scott Wilms, invented it, but because it's a clever piece of technology that combines both reaction and separation within one component. The reactions we're talking about are those that recover hydrogen from hydrogen-containing molecules such as water and methane. And here we've got two examples, the uh, water shift reactor and the steam reforming reaction. The device is composed of a catalyst bed on one side of a specialist membrane. That membrane is designed to only allow hydrogen isotopes. And on the other side of the membrane, we pour a hard vacuum. And we'll give an example of the water shift reaction here where we will introduce CO with the water vapor. And the reaction occurs and we produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And any hydrogen we produce gets pulled through that membrane and can be left on a separate stream. And those of us that remember chemistry is that if you remove the product on the right-hand side, you actually drive the reaction to the right-hand side. And so this is a, a system that has a very, very high recovery for hydrogen isotopes. Uh, and so that's why we're using it. And just to give you an example of what one looks like, here's a photograph of one end of the palladium membrane. Each one of those tubes is the membrane. There's no catalyst. The catalyst will be provided around the membranes and inside those tubes will be where the, the hard vacuum is poured. Okay, the next one we want to talk about is the money sorter, the isotope separation. And just like a money sorter, we need to uh, separate the, and, and sort out the different isotopes one after the other. And so to do this, we use uh, a multi-cascade uh, of cryogenic distillation columns. And here's an example of, of one such system to do so. Now, separation relies upon differences, though the more similar things are, the more difficult they are to separate. And for example, uh, identical twins, uh, like uh, my brother and I, uh, as we grew up. And isotopes are exactly the same. They're very similar, and they have very similar properties. They all react, they all absorb, they all permeate. Though there are very small differences, and we need to exploit those differences to provide a separation. And how do we do this? We do this by distillation. Uh, there's slightly different boiling points or vapor pressures of the isotopes. And uh, here's an example. Um, 
though uh, in the water phase, the separation is very small. And you can see here that the, the difference between normal water and HDO uh, is only 1.02. But if we do this at the elemental form, uh, H2 and HD, you can see the separation factor is a lot greater. Uh, the only problem is that we now have to do this at cryogenic temperatures um, around minus 250 because that's where the boiling point of hydrogen is. And for every stage, we only achieve a 1.73 separation. So in order to get to the purity levels we need, we need to repeat the process, just as we would if you want to have high purity vodka, you need to triple distill it. Well, here we have to uh, distill this multiple times, and we do this in a counter co contacting column. And here's some pictures and uh, photographs of an example. Uh, these are from the Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology. Uh, in Germany, and it shows the, the, the column and the condenser and the reboiler and some of the secondary containment systems that we need around the cryogenic system. The next is the storage and delivery system. This is the central hub of the tritium plant. This is where the various products are collected and distributed to the various clients. It is also where we distribute uh, non-active gases used such as the seeding gases. Uh, and uh, we also collect helium-3 from the decay as we store tritium because helium-3 is a valuable uh, commodity and used in, in the physics world. This system is being delivered uh, by our uh, KODA team uh, from South Korea. One of the key technologies, or the key technology of uh, the storage and delivery system is the hydride beds. And we mentioned earlier the property of hydride and here we make use of this because it's a very safe way of storing hydrogen because at room temperature, the metal can suck on the hydrogen isotopes to, and uh, the pressure above is very low. So if you knock the top off, off the container, you won't see any, any hydrogen. And then to recover it, we need to heat this up. And this is what this plot is showing, where uh, the uh, pink temperature, pink is the temperature, and this is like a light switch. You, you turn on the heater, the beds get hot, and you can see from the blue, the pressure above the bed increases. Uh, and it increases and you hold the temperature steady and you get a nice pressure above the bed. And then when you want to re uh, stop uh, re uh, uh, the supply, you simply turn off the heat and the hydrogen gets sucked back on the bed. And this re is repeatable and very re repeatable and that's why we use this. An example of what one of these looks like is a bed that was designed and built in Los Alamos Na National Laboratory in the 90s. Um, and this one you can see here is actually gold plated and they use uh, the gold plate uh, to make sure that there was uh, a very, uh, there was a, a good ability to measure the decay heat. And so one could actually estimate the, or measure very accurately the tritium on the bed. And though for, tritium, for, for, for the ITER plant of tritium, we don't need to use this uh, functionality. So we're not gold plating our systems. Okay, so a little bit about how to handle tritium safely. So uh, back in section one, we spoke about the decay of tritium and and the beta particle being very, very weak. It can be stopped by the, the dead cells on your skin. So, um, and uh, the decay heat is very small. And uh, in comparison to other radionuclides, it's a, a fairly uh, benign isotope. There's no issue of criticality, such as plutonium or uranium. Uh, there isn't any strong gamma radiation that can penetrate walls and materials. Uh, and there isn't any significant decay heat that we have to worry about. Though there is a hazard, and that is if you breathe in the tritium or you get it through a cut in your, in your hand, you can have an impact. And so the key to handling tritium safely is to keep it away from people. And so if we always keep tritium inside what we call uh, uh, the primary confinement or the first barrier, we're safe. And we do this by using very highly tight uh, systems such as metal tubes and vessels and fittings uh, that are very robust. To, to keep the tritium within the systems. Though, in the case of an off-normal event, we've got multiple lines of defense. And the first one is uh, using secondary barriers. And what we mean by that is to, to enclose uh, the first barrier with another barrier. And we do this by using things such as a glove box. And here's a photograph of someone working uh, through a glove box uh, in, in TPL in Japan. Secondly, we've got a a detection and alarm and uh, evacuation to remove people should we have a, a breach of the primary confinement. And then finally, we have the ability to detritiate. And this leads 
to the detrudiation system, which we're going to talk about next. This is a system that is being co-developed and delivered by our Japanese partners at the JADA. And it's kind of analogous to a wet uh, vacuum cleaner uh, because uh, we have a filter to collect particles. Uh, we've got a blower that provides the suck and we've got a water contacting system. Uh, the difference here is that uh, because the tritium may also be in the elemental form, we need to be able to convert any uh, hydrogen to water. And so we've got a catalytic reactor, similar to the kind of catalytic reactors that we all drive around in our cars, the catalytic converter. And for us, instead of using a pool of water, we're using a uh, continuously wetted co uh, contacting column that provides a better efficiency for capturing tritium. And so at the column, we pour clean water at the top, there's an exchange, and at the top, we uh, clean water vapor leaves, and the tritiated water is collected at the bottom. So great, we've now got the tritium into water. Now what we're going to do with it? So we have to recycle it, and we do this in the water detritiation system. And this system is going to be delivered by the uh, European Domestic Agency. The technology we've currently selected uh, to perform this duty is something called uh, combined chemical exchange and electrolysis. And we'll quickly run through this uh, on a simple flow sheet. So here comes the water from the detritiation system. We store these in tanks, and then we feed the water to the electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer splits the, the water into a hydrogen and oxygen stream. And the hydrogen containing the tritium is sent to a catalyst column special uh, column uh, packed with catalyst. From the top, we pour in uh, clean uh, proteated water, clean water, and there is an exchange reaction uh, because of the catalyst, which concentrates the tritium into the water phase. From the top of the column, we uh, emit uh, clean uh, hydrogen, and uh, the uh, concentrated tritiated water is returned to the electrolyzer and uh, the hydrogen side stream is sent to the ISS, completing the loop. And here's a photograph of an example test facility, again from Karlsruhe in Germany. And we've actually got some of this equipment already installed. So these are were some photographs that we took uh, a month after I joined ITER. Uh, these are some of the storage tanks which are captive. And so they were so large that we had to install them into the basement and then we had to cu the, uh, cast the concrete floors on top, and these were provided by F4E on time. And finally, uh, the end analysis. And so uh, we spoke about uh, the natural abundance of tritium which could be measured. And so we could have got 18 orders of magnitude between natural uh, abundance levels and pure. We also see that tritium can exist in various states. It can be a gas, it can be a liquid or, or even a solid. Um, and it can also form different molecules. And so we have uh, elemental, uh, water, and organic material. And so we need to employ a variety of different analytical techniques to do three main jobs. Um, the first uh, reason to measure tritium is to make sure that we know where the tritium is from a point of view of managing safety. And we do this by radio protection means. The next is for process control. And so sometimes we need to understand how well the system is performing, and so we need an analytical capability to tell us. And then finally, uh, we need to account for where we have the, the tritium uh, on an annual basis, and so we have analytical technology to allow us to do that. And this analytical technology uses a variety of different properties, some based upon uh, the radioactive nature of tritium, uh, such as a luminescence in the, uh, in the scintillation counter, the heat of decay in the calorimeters, and ionizing of gases in an ionization chamber. But we also use chemical properties and molecular properties such as bond energy um, and masses as well. And so we use a variety of different techniques in the analytical system. Okay, so uh, this is my final uh, slide. Uh, we'll just run through the summary. So tritium and deuterium are isotopes of hydrogen. Isotopes are the same element, but they vary because of the different number of neutrons in their nucleus. In a DT fusion reactor, we need to have a closed fusion cycle because of uh, the helium will build up. When we remove the helium, we also remove the tritium and deuterium. The burn is so low, and because tritium is, experiment, uh, is expensive, we can't have a once-through system, and so we need to cycle uh, the fuel in 
the fuel back to the fueling systems. In order to do so, we employ multiple technologies such as purification, isotope separation, uh, storage technologies like hydriding, uh, abatement systems, uh, and uh, a variety of different analytical technologies. And finally, we do this all uh, very safely using multiple confinement strategies and a detritiation system. So that brings me to the end of my uh, video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Uh, we could have gone into a lot more detail and perhaps there will be a future video, but keep an eye out on the channel for our next video. Thank you very much. Goodbye.